The fentanyl crisis is indeed a crisis. It has claimed the lives of too many people, many of them children. So we sat down with families of some of these victims to discuss the circumstances of their loss and what they are doing to change the future for other kids in America. Patricia Drews, driven by the tragic loss of her daughter, Heaven Lay Nelson, to fentanyl poisoning, has become a prominent advocate against this epidemic. Through her work with the forgotten victims of North Carolina, Drews seeks to raise awareness and support families affected by similar tragedies. Her efforts include authoring Death of America's Future, participating in roundtable discussions on fentanyl's impact, and advocating for the use of terms like poisoning or drug-induced homicide in order to pursue severe charges for fentanyl dealers. She grew up in Alberta, Canada. I'm a dual citizen of Canada. She went to the School of the Arts there. She was smart. She was beautiful. Uh, we wound up moving back to North Carolina in 2012 when she turned 18. Something happened to heaven um, that was very traumatic to her. Uh, she wound up going to a party. At this party, she was drugged and raped. Um, it was so traumatic to her when I took her to the hospital and she had bruises and the, all. They treated her like it was her fault. She says, Mama, if they treat me like this now, how do you think they will treat me when we go to court? And, and you know, that's why I always say silence is deadly because in my daughter's case, it was. Um, so she w started experimenting with pills and eventually she moved on to the harder drugs. And I said, Heaven, you know, I don't understand why. She says, well, Mama, sometimes it's easier to, to stay high so that I don't have to think about what happened. April Babcock, through her leadership of Lost Voices of Fentanyl, has turned a personal tragedy into a powerful force for change in the wake of her son Austin's death due to fentanyl poisoning in 2019. Her organization aims to educate the public, support bereaved families, and push for effective solutions to stop illicit fentanyl poisonings. My son died at 25. I, it's really hard for me. I'm just sitting here listening to her tell her story. When I tell my son's story, then it's the emotion. It makes me cry. It's really hard. He was my baby. He loved soccer. He was just a good kid. He was so laid back. He started dabbling in drugs at the age of 19, and this is what I want to like hone in on. He's dead by 25. Before fentanyl, you had umpteen chances of recovery. 10, 20, 30 years. Now, you don't have a chance. My son never made it to a rehab. Kids should learn from mistakes. Now they die from, it can take one mistake. Rachel Carlisle embarked on a mission to raise awareness about the dangers of fentanyl after her daughter, Mariah Earp, tragically passed away from fentanyl poisoning in 2020. Mariah, a mother of three, thought she was taking Xanax, not knowing the deadly risk involved. In response to her death, Rachel launched a billboard campaign in her Indiana community, utilizing her daughter's image to highlight the peril of fentanyl-laced pills. Additionally, she's been vocal on social media platforms like TikTok, sharing her daughter's story to break the stigma associated with discussing the loss of a child to fentanyl. My daughter, Mariah, she was um, an exceptional human. She was my whole world. She was not only my daughter, she was a sister, a granddaughter. She was raped in junior high. I was not aware of it. You know, all the signs were there. I could see her mental health was declining and so took her to the doctor and was put on some medication for her depression and uh, everything seemed good. She actually got accepted into the Chicago Art Academy, um, but she fell in love and she decided that she wasn't gonna go. And she had three babies, pretty much back to back, and um, she had postpartum. And what I also did not know was that she was in a very abusive relationship. May 14th of 2020, I got that phone call at 4.35 in the morning that my child was dead. I didn't understand. It made absolutely no sense. Um, my daughter didn't have a history of addiction. She had parents that are in recovery. And so she, you know, witnessed all of it and she hated, she hated what drugs do to families. And so Mariah was very adamant, that's not gonna be my life, that's not gonna be my life. So what she started doing was getting her medication off of her friends. And no, she should not have been doing that illegally, but she thought it was all safe. I mean, they were just pills. They're Xanax. I mean, that's safe, right? And six weeks later, I got my confirmation that it was fentanyl that killed my child. And now here I am 
because I couldn't save my child, but I'm desperately with these other mamas, desperately trying to save someone else's child. So all three of you have been doing that, turning your pain into purpose and, and trying to fight against the scourge of, of fentanyl. When you look at, at what the administration has been doing, wh what do you make of that? It's a punch in my face. Mm -hmm. I, I thought the sitting president is supposed to put Americans first. He has given operational control to the Mexican cartels. That's exactly what he's done. We need to close the border all along, you know, our southern end. We have to. I mean, we have 100,000 kids dying every year in this country. When you meet with politicians, what do they tell you? Do they meet with you? What, what do they say? I've met with one, um, Senator Todd Young's office, and um, they pretty much were, you know, well, we deal more with the mental health. And I have told them time and time again, this falls in the same category. Because again, the traumas, that is one of the reasons that a lot of people do turn to things. Last year, you and I went and spoke before the Republican um, Study Committee, and I had collected a whole box of obituaries from parents all across the country. And I took those obituaries and I presented them to the congressman there. And they did ask for a meeting with Joe Biden to give him these obituaries, and he's never accepted that meeting. On April 1st, 2021, in year one of his presidency, Joe Biden submitted to Congress his drug policy priorities. Number two on that list was, quote, advancing racial equity in our approach to drug policy. When it comes to drug arrests, drug traffickers are disproportionately ethnic minorities. Because the Biden administration is heavily focused on equity, this means the Biden administration has decided to go soft on drug offending. In October 2022, Joe Biden announced a pardon of all federal marijuana possession charges, calling criminalization of pot a, quote, failed approach. He then called on all state governors to do the same. But... As scholar Heather McDonald has pointed out, drug possession charges are typically plea bargain deals. Most people who end up in prison for possession were originally charged with trafficking, and then they pled out for a lower charge. In December 2023, Joe Biden commuted the sentences of and pardoned thousands of nonviolent drug offenders. This list of crimes for which Biden commuted sentencing included charges of conspiracy to distribute meth, conspiracy to distribute and possess with intent to distribute more than five kilograms of a mixture and substance containing cocaine and more than 50 grams of a mixture and substance containing cocaine base. Drug dealers convicted of intent to distribute are now back on the street. Terry Almanza, a former Chicago police officer, has seen firsthand the devastation wrought by fentanyl on the streets of one of America's largest cities. Terry's experience in the trenches dealing with the fallout of this deadly drug provides a poignant insight into the challenges our law enforcement faces daily. She successfully pursued a drug-induced homicide charge in her own daughter's case and advocates for the same across the country. So the drug-induced homicide statute um, is a statute used within our judicial system to hold drug dealers accountable when the substance that they deliver uh, results in a death. But sadly, um, in many states, whether they have the statute or not, it just, you know, um, isn't being enforced. Um, and that was kind of the, the, the stance of the Chicago Police Department when my daughter died. It took 16 months for me to get the Chicago Police Department to bring in the people that I knew were responsible the day that she died to question them. And I mean, I had spoke with the chief of organized crime and he said, they're never gonna admit to it, Terry. And I said, we're the Chicago Police Department. We're the best of the best, you know. Uh, we deal with the most horrific, hardened criminals. Bring them in and question them. So they did, and they both admitted to selling my daughter a lethal dose of MDMA, and they were charged with my daughter's homicide. They were released out on bond uh, in Cook County, Kim Fox. While they were out on bond, they did it again, and they sold to an undercover Orland Park officer. They were uh, subsequently uh, convicted of her homicide in 2018. But, you know, it just, it was crushing. It was crushing um, to lose her and um, terrible that um, law enforcement would not um, investigate it criminally. You know, if she was shot and killed, law enforcement would have treated that as a homicide and, you know, investigated criminally. But because I think of the stigma tied to illicit drug use, these victims are often dismissed. And so we want to try to shift the mindset within the judicial system away from accidental to now criminal and treating these suspected poisonings as homicides. J.J. Niederman was only 19 years old when he died of fentanyl poisoning. 
He believed he was experimenting with cocaine, entirely unaware of the megadose of fentanyl hiding inside. JJ ingested enough fentanyl to kill 30 adults and died in his bedroom inside his family home in Mantua, New Jersey, just 23 minutes from Camden. Tanya Niederman was nearby at a restaurant when she received the call that her son was dead. Recreational drug use does not exist anymore. I've said it a million times, but he was doing everything right. Um, he wasn't a troublemaker and, you know, one mistake that he made cost him his life. There are people that that think that, you know, it only happens to people who have drug problems or people who are in active addiction and all these things, but it's not the case. It's, it's happening to 19 year old sons like mine. It's happening to eight year old kids in their bedrooms. It's happening to 40 year old grown men. Like it's not, it's not discriminating against anyone. We had 1,308 opioid poisonings in Chicago in 2023, and not one drug-induced homicide conviction has taken place. And I will say, I've been working with the Chicago Police Department. Uh, the former chief of detectives, uh, Brendan Deanahan, came up with a, with a protocol. So when law enforcement does respond to these types of cases, they do treat these cases like crime scenes and they are taking phones and recovering evidence and they have invited myself and a couple other families out to come and give trainings to new detectives and all of that is great and I'm so thankful for it but we need to put that in play in the field you know and so if the numbers aren't coming in if we still are losing people at these record numbers but drug dealers are still not going to jail we need to do more. Yes, police departments should be investigating it this, this way, but there's so many progressive prosecutors across the country who will simply refuse to prosecute the case, even if the facts are broad, that it's creating a downward pressure on police departments not to investigate. Why, mm -hmm. why bother expending the resources if the prosecutor is not going to, to bring the case right. in the first place? So wh where do you think the problem starts and, and how do we solve it? So I think so uh, in McHenry County, uh, the state's attorney is, his name is Patrick Keneally. And that was kind of something that Kim Fox had said in Cook County. She said, well, it's not that I have a protocol against or a policy against the drug and use homicide statute. It's just that the Chicago Police Department doesn't present any cases. Well, that's her easy out, you know. So where in McHenry County, Patrick Keneally, who leads Illinois in these prosecutions, and he is just amazing, he notifies law enforcement when these types of cases come across, you are to contact my office and we are gonna send out a state's attorney and we are gonna make sure that the phone is inventory, the narcotics are inventory, we write a search warrant, we pull up tollway records, banking apps, all the things that need to be done. So when we need to present this case, it's a strong case. Why aren't these cases being presented to the state's attorneys? Why aren't the state's attorneys, you know, prosecuting these cases? Because I think years ago, you know, uh, in the open air market, uh, it was these cases were a lot more difficult to to prove without the cell phones. But now with the cell phones and with social media, um, I, I just really believe that these cases are prosecutable cases. Congressman Morgan Griffith is the U.S. Representative for Virginia's 9th Congressional District and has been since 2011. Congressman Griffith has been a major part of the effort to combat the fentanyl crisis via his bill, H.R. 467, the HALT Fentanyl Act. I think that most Americans understand if you have an addiction that, that you may need some help and that maybe that needs to be looked at a little bit differently than perhaps we did 30 years ago. But if you're trafficking, particularly something as harmful as fentanyl, you ought to get the big sentences because what we find is if they know that they're going to face or if they actually face significant jail time, it changes their behavior and we need to make sure that we're encouraging that because right now it's open season on America's youth, particularly when you hear stories, and I heard one just this week in, in my area, of a kid who bought some marijuana and then tested for marijuana and fentanyl, had no idea. Instead of cracking down on drug dealers, Biden has focused on so-called harm reduction. Such policies often encompass pushing aside actual penalties and resources for drug-related crimes in favor of policies like needle and syringe exchange programs like those present in Kensington, handing out free crack pipes, medication-assisted treatments like methadone clinics, the decriminalization of drug use, handing out of test strips used to ensure that whatever illegal drugs are taken are fentanyl-free. Some of these are worthwhile, but it doesn't get to the root of the problem. Once people are addicted, the path to tragedy has already been paved. The only way to truly stop the fentanyl crisis is to stop it at the source. How could Joe Biden stop the fentanyl crisis at its source? Well. He could provide more serious sentences for drug offending, but he'd also have to figure out a way to crack down on trafficking from China and Mexico. And that hasn't happened. Congressman Mike Gallagher is a distinguished member of the United States House of Representatives. He serves as chairman of the House Select Committee on the strategic competition between the United States and the Chinese Communist Party. 
Congressman Gallagher brings a wealth of knowledge and a strong stance on holding China accountable for its role in the global fentanyl trade. For years, China has been the fentanyl factory of the world. And for years, Xi Jinping has pledged to do something about it, but that hasn't happened. The Biden administration wants us to believe that another verbal commitment from Xi and more so-called task forces will finally stem the deadly tide of precursor production from China. But are we really to believe that the most powerful techno-totalitarian state in human history couldn't stop this plague in a heartbeat if it wanted to? So what are the steps that the Biden administration should be taking that they're not taking right now? A few obvious things. We can crack down on the money laundering practices which fuel the industry and the payment methods, including WeChat Pay, which enables illegal profits from this toxic trade uh, to make their way back to China. We could also impose sanctions on the port operators, the shipping companies that handle and ship improperly labeled fentanyl precursors and eliminate the de minimis loophole that has allowed countless fentanyl shipments to evade customs inspections. But even that, I think, will not be effective unless we secure our southern border. If we are not strong at the southern border, districts like mine are going to continue to be effectively border districts and sons, daughters, parents are going to suffer as a result of this ongoing fentanyl crisis we face in America. Meanwhile, Mexico continues to pass the buck. Until recently, Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador didn't even acknowledge that fentanyl was manufactured in Mexico, dismissing responsibility while using a network that he established in the United States to convince voters of Mexican descent to refrain from voting for candidates who use strong rhetoric against Mexico in light of the crisis. Congressman Daniel Newhouse represents Washington State's 4th District. He served multiple terms and has served for the state's Department of Agriculture as director. However, these days, he's focused on the national fentanyl problem, co-sponsoring the bipartisan Save Americans from the Fentanyl Emergency Act, or SAFE Act, to permanently schedule all fentanyl-related substances Schedule 1, and to ensure law enforcement has the resources they need to keep it off the streets. So why don't you walk me through some of the policies that you would like to see implemented? So uh, there's a couple pieces of, it, of legislation that I'm working on right now that I, I gotta say, honestly, don't necessarily address or interdict the importation of fentanyl, but more deals with the uh, scourge of the drug while it's here in our country. One, uh, I'd like to make sure that Narcan be available in our schools. And that sounds crazy that we have to do that, but uh, the, the drug is in our schools, whether you're in a big city or in a rural area like I represent. And then the other thing, we're trying to make sure that all fentanyl related substances that come into the country are covered by our laws. Currently, the cartels who are not stupid people, they're very clever, know that if they change the combination of substances that they're importing or, or exporting into our country, that some of those drugs are not covered by our laws. And so prosecutors who are trying to nail dealers for selling illegal substances are faced with a much higher burden of proof. If we can regulate that by including all fentanyl related substances under the Schedule 1 uh, classification, that will eliminate that problem and reduce the amount of time we can it takes to prosecute and convict drug dealers. Frankly, a lot of people are kind of throwing up their hands saying, we can't stop this. Uh, we shouldn't even try. We shouldn't even put the resources into stopping the drug from coming in because the problem is so large. I don't think we can throw up our hands and, and give up. We need to keep pushing hard, working hard uh, to stop the illegal flow of people and the illegal flow of drugs. What action should the United States government, if, if it could or if it would, be taking against China? Yeah, if we had proper political leadership on fentanyl, we would begin by the bold, I think, truthful statement that we cannot have normal relations with a country that is poisoning Americans, that is killing 100,000 people every single year through this action. And then we need to start looking at punitive actions we can take to damage them. Uh, I'm generally a free trade guy, but do you want to have free trade uh, with a country that is poisoning your citizens in such a systematic way? I don't think so. Here's the challenge we face with President Xi. President Xi revered his father, who was a former high-ranking CCP official. He even built a mausoleum to his father. When his father was 14, at age 14, he tried to poison his teacher because he was not sufficiently revolutionary. President Xi thinks this is good. He thinks this is a cool thing. So that's the kind of leader that we're dealing with. So we've got to get tough and we've got to make clear you are going to suffer consequences and real damage until you stop doing this to our people.
I really believe that um, no matter what side of the room you sit on, it's not a one side issue or the other side issue. It's it's an American issue. It's a citizen issue. I don't know what to say to the president other than, you know, people are losing their lives. We're losing our children. And I don't know why this is not a bigger, important issue than it is. It's terrible. It's terrible to lose a child no matter by whatever means um, parents are not supposed to bury their kids. And I want, and I do this every day because I don't want anybody else to sit in this chair. I died that day with my daughter. I died that day. And my daughter left behind three children, three beautiful pieces of her. It's a narco state. We all know it. We the people see it. We're sick of funerals. We need something done. We need someone in that White House that is gonna put Americans first. Our children are dying. Babies are dying. 10 year olds, 11, 12. How long are we gonna let this continue? It's simply not in China's and Mexico's interest to stop the fentanyl trafficking, which means that absent strong American action, nothing is going to get done. And Biden isn't taking that strong action. Despite bipartisan coalitions of multiple attorneys general urging Biden to classify fentanyl as a WMD due to the ability of minuscule amounts of fentanyl to kill a person, for example, Joe Biden hasn't done that. Letters written by these coalitions were followed by a report saying that the DOD, FBI, and DHS were prepping for a fentanyl WMD attack as far back as 2018. Still, Biden will not label fentanyl a WMD risk. Solutions like increased funding for detection technology at our border, or say, you know, shutting down the border itself, haven't been tried either. All of this information leads to the same conclusion. Joe Biden is unserious about fentanyl, and people are dying in unprecedented numbers because of it.